This program is made possible in part thanks to generous donations from viewers like you. Welcome to the Suzanne Atwell Show. Thanks for joining us. In this episode, Mental Illness in Sarasota County, the availability of care, public-private partnerships, and partisan political meddling in public health. Any mental illness, or AMI, is a mental, behavioral, or emotional disorder which can vary in impact from no impairment to serious impairment. Serious mental illness, or SMI, limits major life activities and can become a disability. 14 million suffer from SMI. The National Institutes of Health reports 57.8 million people, nearly 23% of all adults in the United States, experience AMI in a year. Alarmingly, among adolescents aged 13 to 18, nearly half reported any mental disorder. One in five of those were serious. We've had four kids that I know of personally that came in for a completely unrelated problem, so a broken arm or an earache or whatever it was, and actually were acutely suicidal to the point where we needed to transfer them to inpatient uh, facility right to then and there. So we're catching kids you know, who are in very much crisis like that, um, but we're also catching the kids that just need help and don't know what to do and haven't really talked about this. We also know that young girls are especially at risk. We know nearly half of all gay, lesbian, and bisexuals experience mental illness. We know abortion bans are a source of great anxiety for women. And we know the state of Florida is one of the worst providers of mental health care in the country. A 2022 National Mental Health Survey ranked Florida number 49 for access to mental health care. There has also been a record increase of Florida children being detained under the Baker Act. It doesn't surprise me that you've got Baker Acts at the highest level, suicide at the highest level. You've got children with depression, anxiety, acting out of control, uh, intermittent explosive disorder, highest levels I've seen in my 30-year career. The COVID pandemic has accelerated these disturbing trends, but partisan politics are contributing to the problem. Governor DeSantis threats to local school boards who required masks. Don't say gay laws have put children and families at risk. And here in Sarasota County, nearly two years after the creation of a mental health taxing district, County Commissioners Mike Moran and Christian Ziegler delayed much-needed funds that taxpayers have already approved. Ignoring a professional behavioral health advisory group, Ziegler objected to support for a group that helps gay and lesbian teens. Moran rejected the advisory board because it didn't include an organization called Teen Court, where Moran's wife, is the chief operating officer. In the wake of threats and intimidation by the governor, the Sarasota County School Board, and county commissioners, many public officials we invited to be on this program declined. One person this community can count on for common sense and informed commentary is our first guest, Carrie Seidman. You are a trusted journalist um, in our community. And you are also an outspoken and staunch advocate for mental health care. A 2019 Community Health Assessment identified mental health as a strategic priority. Where are we? How would you rate the progress on that? Well, I arrived in Sarasota in 2010, and I arrived with my only child, my son, who was in the midst of very severe mental health issues. And I can tell you at least that from 2010 to today, we have made improvements. There have been quite a number of improvements. Um, are we there yet? Not by any means. And I recently had an encounter with 
the crisis stabilization unit here um, with a with a young friend of mine and was horrified to find <laughs> that it was pretty much the same thing it had been in 2010 when it was um, very uh, disturbing. Um, and so we definitely still have lots of room for improvement, um, but we have a lot of things now that we didn't have in 2010. We have some mental health diversion courts. We have um, the Academy at Glengarry, which is a vocational training program for people in recovery from mental health crises. We have um, a drop-in center run by the National Alliance on Mental Illness. The, the NAMI chapter is revived. And so what is NAMI? So NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. It's a national organ, grassroots organization, and there are chapters in different cities, and they're there to provide mental health education and to provide support to peers and their families. Mm -hmm. And when I arrived here in 2010, the Sarasota chapter of NAMI was pretty much defunct. And we also have, um, although it hasn't come to fruition the way I had hoped, we have a mental health tax district that was supposed to supply um, more funding for mental health services. To that point, my next question was, it was created in 2021 to provide mental health care. So here we are two years later. Um, how is the money being spent? What's going on? Well, the money isn't really being spent. I mean, um, I, I gave great credit to the county commission for creating that mental health tax di district and Commissioner Mike Moran was uh, pivotal in, in creating it and I was so pleased when that happened. However, what's happened since then is basically stall after stall after stall. So they created the district, um, then they decided that the commissioners needed to decide who the money would go to, but they decided the commissioners didn't know enough about mental health, which is true, mm -hmm. to make that decision. So they did a study, and that took a long time, and then they appointed a group of experts to help go make site visits and go through all the applications for the money, and um, last Last fall, I believe, I can't remember the exact date, but that group, the experts reported back to the commission and gave their recommendations for which organization should be funded. And the whole thing kind of went for fluey because several of the commissioners had objections um, to uh, several groups that had been recommended for funding for, um, for reasons that uh, were more personal mm -hmm. than, um, than, you know, critical. Mm -hmm. And um, so it is still in a stall at this point. I mean, they have continued the funding that they got through the COVID money um, to help support the programs that are already in place, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, but that new money, there really is no new money that's entering the system right now. Is this, you're talking about the um, commissioners Moran and Ziegler objected to recommendations of the Behavioral Health Advisory Council? Correct. That's what you're speaking to. Boy, and what's the impact of that decision? I mean, what that means is that the programs that are in existence yeah. are still able to function, thank goodness. Um, but there has been no new money or new programming come into existence because of this um, delay. So that's been very disappointing. Delay after delay. Um, I'm hearing, this is pretty disturbing, I'm hearing from people at prominent local foundations who say that Sarasota County has failed miserably in meeting mental health investment needs. It seems that we haven't kept up with the demand, the demands. We have an exploding population um, that we haven't been able to keep up with. So how does mental health and our services fit in with that? Have we kept up? Not in the way that I'd like to see us keep up. Sure. And um, unfortunately, the special mental health tax district that was created to provide more money, to be able to provide more services, has kind of been stalled out for, for about a year because of um, commissioners' questions about which organization should be funded. So there has been not a lot of new money coming right. in from the government side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, 
from the private side, from private philanthropy, I, as you know, Sarasota is is very philanthropic, mm -hmm. and um, I think people have really stepped up mm -hmm. there. Um, the new behavioral health care center um, that was basically held underwritten by the Cornell family is is going to be a real game changer in town because it's going to provide people in crisis not only a place to come to in crisis but to be supported afterward and I think that's a key element that we've been missing. Wonderful. We've invited many public officials to talk about mental health issues um, with no results. Why is that? Do you think that there's a political element to this, political intimidation, that a lot of people up the ladder at their organizations are not able to speak? Um, I, I, I know that there is reluctance on the part of many of the people who are running behavioral health organizations and nonprofits here in town because um, the legis you know the the commission the our local elected officials do hold the cards on um as far as funding goes and i think they're 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 fearful that if they do speak out in a way that seems critical um that it could affect their continued funding final question your valuable opinion carrie <laughs> was it always you touched on this was it always this bad but nobody was talking about it. Or are we truly spiraling out of control here? In many ways, when we had mental health, state mental health institutions, it was somewhat better because at least these people weren't ending up in, in prison and on the street homeless. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, when we did away with the state mental health yeah. hospitals, that's when those other populations started spiraling because we made it basically a crime to mm -hmm. be mentally ill. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, think, um, I think it has gotten worse, and I think a lot of the stressors of society have made it worse. As I said, um, I think the internet has been a huge factor, and social media has been mm -hmm. a huge factor, and just the pressures of modern life mod with all the technology we have. Um, with people so wedded to their phones, with people spending less time in nature, mm -hmm. all of those things, I think, have compounded the problem. Um, but fortunately, I also think that we have a greater awareness. And I will say that I interview, I have a mental health blog and podcast, and uh, so I interview a lot of people about their personal mental health experience. And I'm so um, hopeful when I talk to younger generations mm -hmm. because they are so much more open about talking about mental health, mm -hmm. about admitting the, their need right. for help, um, and being just way more aware than my generation or generations before me ever were. But every time I get hopeful that some legislator is going to take up and champion this cause, I'm disappointed. Mm -hmm. It's not a popular cause mm -hmm. with with legislators. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people have said to me, what what can we do? What, how can we make them realize how important this is? And I mean, I say something that I don't really mean. It's sort of a sarcastic response. But I say, you know, give them a child with schizophrenia. Yeah, they'll they'll understand it really fast. Thank you, Carrie, for hitting the nail squarely on the head. While Sarasota County was ranked low for providing mental health care, there is good news on the way. Our next guest is from Sarasota Memorial Hospital, where a brand new mental health pavilion is being built. Thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. Well, thank you for having me, Suzanne. We're going to be talking about the Cornell Family Behavioral Health Pavilion. Very exciting. So let's start. Let's start with the regional need for this facility that SMH is, is meeting. We have um, 400,000 people that live in this area. And right. um, based on mental illness of individuals, one in five having a mental illness, that would give us 80,000 people just in Sarasota with a mental illness. Mm -hmm. A serious mental illness is more of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder. 
and that's about 5% of the population. So mm. that would be 20,000 people. At the time we, we started talking about this building and what we needed, we recognized there was only about 130 beds in our community. Well, it's exciting because it's not a, when you talk about emergency room, it's not a, a, a scraped knee. These are mental health issues that are people coming and entering a, a place that could be very foreign to them. And it sounds like a welcoming. Right, right. And as you know, um, from, you know, working in the field yourself, mm -hmm. it's a very scary time when you're, mm -hmm. when you're so depressed that you no longer want to live and you're debating whether or not you want to get help because there's stigma attached. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to feel like they're weak and they can't manage their life. Um, and so making that effort to get help, mm -hmm. and then you go into a, a facility that may be stark and harsh right. and frightening, um, that's not going to happen anymore. Our age demographics are quite diverse, as we know. So tell us how that facility will uh, provide space for dedicated populations and what those populations are and how they will be served. Now we'll have a separate children's unit, right. um, and that'll be... Um, so much better than what we have now with the adolescents mixed with mm -hmm. the children. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have a geriatric unit for individuals that may have some medical conditions. Um, so it may not just be dedicated to geriatric, but maybe somebody who has ambulatory issues, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little more frail. Mm -hmm. um, we will also have a mood disorder unit. So that's people mm. with like depression. Um, and then we'll have intensive care unit for people with um, high, you know, acuity, maybe mm -hmm. um, hallucinating. Um, schizophrenia, that sort of unit where they need that more intensive observation. You have the whole gamut there. The whole gamut. Back to the um, geriatric or the senior units. Um, what are the prevalent types of behavioral health issues in this age, other than obviously they may have problems um, getting around, but um, speaking from a psychological standpoint, what are, they, what are our seniors in our community facing here and how will you serve them? Sure. Um, well, the seniors, and many people may not realize this, but back in 2019, and I don't think they've done a more recent study, uh, Sarasota, out of the 67 counties in Florida, was number 12 for seniors committing suicide. So, mm. you know, what's going on a lot of times is uh, uh, individuals are experiencing a lot of loss issues. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's health issues that are declining, mm -hmm. family members, identity with retirement, and who am I now? Um, so they're going through a whole lot of and if they don't have strong coping or strong support system, it can be a very difficult time. What about, let's go into the child and adolescent units. What makes them unique and what are you seeing there, those ages? You know, it's, it's really interesting what we're seeing right now. A lot of children have emotion dysregulation. They don't have the coping skills and resiliency that they once had. And um, I think... At some point in time, they're probably going to do a lot of research and find out what is going on right now. I think many of us can kind of, you know, guess or, or you know, anecdotally, we may think it's social media or the stress or, yeah. um, but we're seeing a lot of uh, kids that were um, during the pandemic um, isolated. Um, some of them are, still haven't been able to get back to school. Right. So we have a lot of kids with tremendous anxiety and depression. And um, recently, the youth risk behavior surveys that they administer every couple of years in the school system mm -hmm. has demonstrated that 45% of the kids are reporting feeling seriously depressed. Mm -hmm. And I believe the report said almost 50% of females have thought about committing suicide, 50%. Yeah, it seems they're more girls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Girls more internalize things, as we know. Absolutely. Right? And so they stifle it, mm -hmm. and boys are more... Mm -hmm. acted out, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as we know. So. Right, absolutely. Um, I'd like to know your personal insight on mental health uh, in general. Um, what is your commentary? I mean, you're in this position uh, with a, a, a powerful new facility and going to meet some more need, greater need in our community. So why is mental Ill illness growing in America? I know. It's, uh, it's certainly, we know, a huge crisis. Um, you know, when you look at the reports, they say access is an issue, um, stigma is an issue. If people don't want to admit that they have behavioral health issues, also cost can be an issue for many people. Mm -hmm. So if they're not accessing the services they need, they, they estimate that 50% um, of us will have a mental health um, illness or disorder within our lifetime. 
you know, that can be anxiety, that can be depression, it could be an adjustment disorder because of whatever's going on in your family. But 50% of us, and uh, for so long, people have just not wanted to admit it and talk about it. I think that has been, um, as they say, the silver lining in the pandemic is that people are now coming forward and talking about, and I, I, I feel so grateful when celebrities and high profile people come out and they admit to theirs because it helps normalize it for everyday people. Of course. And it sounds like this, um, this facility, um, it's just opened up along with everything else. It's very comprehensive. It's needed in our community. People are supporting it and funding. Um, this is wonderful to see this happening. And uh, when is the facility supposed to open? Um, we will open in December. Oh. And it's going to be, it's, it really is a game changer. The building is so innovative. Every unit has sensory rooms. So where people can just, our, our patients can go. Mm. And it's a, a sensory room is very calming. It, you know, you have mm. aromatherapy, you have mm. visual uh, projections on the wall, you have tactile stimulation with fiber optic lighting, maybe bubble machines. Mm -hmm. And it really helps people stay in the present here mm -hmm. and now and not be you know, ruminating about the past or the future, but just staying right. in the here and now and right. learning how to cope. And it's very relaxing. So we'll have that on every unit. We'll have, um, I have to tell you, everything about this unit has been intentionally designed. Every element from space to lighting to sound to even the landscape has mm. been intentional. Mm. So uh, the, the um, building, the colors, are just soothing, all mm -hmm. based towards recovery. The mm -hmm. the pictures on the walls. It's just going to be a new day. And then down on the first floor, we'll have a lot of outpatient programs. So individuals that might be going from intensive acute um, psychiatric service inpatient can now be introduced to the outpatient services. And we have amazing teams. We just launched a youth um, intensive outpatient program. Mm -hmm. Because we have the children coming in and staying with us for four or five days is not going to do it because there's so much going on. So now with this outpatient program funded by, again, um, Gulf Coast Foundation here for Youth and the Brancic Foundation, very generously um, because of the gaps in service they recognized, uh, we launched that program about three weeks ago. And now these children will be able to stay with us for four to six weeks while we help them every day go home, face their triggers, their traumas. Mm -hmm. their life stressors, mm -hmm. and then come back in the afternoon and we can work with them. They'll be with us for nine hours a week. And again, a multidisciplinary team of nurses, psychiatrists, therapists, um, working with them and their families to really help stabilize them. Well, this sounds fantastic. And it certainly sounds like it's the, um, this behavioral center is going to hold the standard that is Sarasota Memorial Hospital. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me, Suzanne. Mm -hmm. We look forward to the opening and we'll follow up when it does. Our final guest is a trained mental health provider who is focused on parenting. From her, we get an inside look at the complexity and urgent need for better care. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, the Florida Center. Tell us about the background. How, what's going on with the Florida Center now and a little bit of the history of it. Yeah. So the Florida Center has been around since 79, and originally it started out as an early childhood organization to serve young children with, with disabilities or developmental delays. And then over the years, it has grown and to meet the need of the community. And in 2003, the organization merged with a local organization that used to be here called the Family Counseling Center. And um, that organization served families all the way through adulthood, and so it became we became an organization that not only served young children but then served older. And for a few years, we really struggled with that and realized that we need to really get back to our roots and became the Florida Center for Early Childhood. We expanded our age range to serve those through elementary school. Mm -hmm. So at this stage, we are um, very focused on prenatal through those elementary school years. Um, and really a one-stop shop for families who are either new parents or have children that are transitioning from preschool or into preschool um, and then into the elementary age um, because there's a lot that goes into those early years. And we believe how strongly that, you know, the, the more you do in those early years, you get definitely get more bang for your buck. And that's, as you know, as you obviously know, early diagnosis and treatment is crucial here. 
Tell us about child-parent psychotherapy. Child-parent psychotherapy, or CPP, is um, and it's an, an evidence-based intervention that um, it, that is primarily uh, for children and their families who are ages birth through elementary, or excuse me, birth through five years old. Mm -hmm. And um, to really focus on those traumas that have occurred for children in those early years and to assist families in how to heal, how to help that child heal. It's a dyadic model, which is right. a parent-child um, model. We don't work with young children in isolation. We work with them through their relationships. So parents aren't aware of how their own trauma histories or life experiences come into play when they begin parenting. We think that we're just going to you know, just start parenting unaware of, of how our experiences have influenced who we are and how we view the world and how we view children. So the modality helps to heal that relationship through um, helping parents see their child as an individual and as a human and work on really healing both the parent and the child through the relationship. There have been a lot of reporting on state policies and laws that have curtailed funding and support for LGBTQ children in the public schools. So aren't these children at higher risk of emotional and behavioral symptoms? Absolutely. I think it depends on uh, certainly how the caregivers in their environment support their unique needs, um, understanding how the child feels, making sure that we understand what the child's experiencing in terms of um, their, their um, sexuality, how they feel about others. And it's important to have compassion and, and have, especially the caregivers, not just their, we think of caregivers as parents, but, right. but those who care for our children every day, preschool pe teachers, early care and education, elementary school teachers, administration, how everyone views or, or um, um, supports those students is very important. What about public investment? We'll go back to public investment in mental health. How would you rate Sarasota County? Currently, the county is asking some hard questions. They're wanting to understand um, yes. what's happening in our community and where to best allocate dollars. You know, mm -hmm. I certainly can't fault anyone for asking those questions. Of course, as the leader of an organization that serves young children and as an early childhood mental health professional myself, who's been doing this for over 25 years, I know that putting money in the early years is very important. We have a lot of families coming to the area. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of families with young children coming to the area. So to, to understand how we are saving money by putting a lot of services in on the front end, and early care and education is one of those that I feel very strongly about. Um, if children do not have quality early care and education. That is a huge disadvantage. And so they are going to be entering our schools. And, and parents are working hard to care for their children and trying to, to earn a living wage to care mm -hmm. for them. And so if they're placing their child in a substandard early care and education mm -hmm. site, that's going to be really um, detri a detriment to them. They're going to they're be at a disadvantage as they enter oh, elementary oh, school. That. Final question. The incidence of child um, with mental illness is um, increasing kind of exponentially. And it's disturbing. So are we just more aware of it now? Mm -hmm. Or has it been that way? Or has there been changes in society uh, that are behind these trends? Because clearly, we're going on a continuum of not good trends. I do anecdotally believe that it is on the increase. There is definitely, um, it hasn't always been the way that it is now. We've known that it exists, but to the degree that it does now, it, it is very apparent that children are absorbing the stress in their environment, whether they experience it at home or in their schools or from listening to what's on TV, they are absorbing it. Parents are more stressed than ever um, between the pandemic, the economy, a hurricane, all of those things that are happening, children absorb it and they understand that there's something stressful. I mean, by 11 months of age, children understand what makes the adults in their lives uncomfortable. So an older child is certainly going to understand that and behave accordingly. And based on temperament, they're going to, some of them are going to hold it in, some are going to be external with it and so, and show sure. us big, big behaviors. So um, it's, it's definitely on the rise, and so it's something that I think we ought, absolutely ought to pay attention to and um, try, to, try to figure out as a community. The data does not lie. We are in the midst of an urgent public health situation. Fortunately for Sarasota, private philanthropy and foundations recognize the need 
and are stepping up. But small town politics and special interests are holding us back. We have grown into a sophisticated, cultured city, but our governing charters have failed to keep pace. Few of our elected representatives are professionally fit for office. Big problems like mental health and climate change, big opportunities like the Bay Park Conservancy demand public-private leadership. Fortunately, the private part is working. If you would like more information on mental health, please click these links, and you can always watch this show and all my previous episodes on my YouTube and website. Well, that wraps up another one. Hope you learned something and enjoyed the show. Until next time, thanks for watching. I'm Suzanne Atwell, and I'll see you around town. Atwell Media is a registered, not-for-profit 501c3. If you would like to support local public service programming like this, please visit our website, suzanneatwell.org, to make a tax-deductible donation. Thank you for watching.